Hello, this is Hiroja Shai, and I thought I would talk about the definition of money, or at least the concept of the monetary policy that we are all part of, and which Bitcoin is, is attempting to supplant and replace. So this is money, the word money, and money has unique attributes. So we're going to talk about these new attributes. We're going to talk about one, storage of value, two, medium exchange, three, the unit of account, four, liquidity, and then we're going to talk about a fifth one that's very unique to Bitcoin specifically that money in it itself does not possess. So we're going to, just going to remove number five and it's an attribute that Bitcoin brings to the concept of money. Money which has been around for eons. Um, if you're unaware of this, when there are certain attributes of every civilization that are very consistent across the board and one of these concepts is that there is a money type system a medium of exchange a storage value uh, a unit of accounting whether it be seashells these uh big stone rings that uh, in the Pacific Islands, I forget at the moment the tribe that does it, that is considered um, money, that the trade is still valid, even though uh, in one transaction, the, the stone broke through the boat and landed in the ocean. Uh, beads, gold, silver, salt, uh, twine, uh, horses, a lot of this has changed uh, what we consider to be the storage value, the exchange, the unit count, and the liquidity of these particular items. But at any point of existence, you will find money at some point in any civilization. Uh, the, the first thing you always find is um, you'll find some type of gods. Typically, it's uh, three gods. They're broken down to the fertility god which is typically the feminine form. You will find, always you will find some form of a death ceremony or acknowledgement of death, whether it be worshiping as a god or just a, a very elaborate, or elaborate for that particular civilization, death ceremonies, whether you are a pauper or a king. Uh, when people bury you, the ones that love you and care for you, there is some form of ceremony. There's some form of uniqueness, whether it be the clothes that they wear, uh, trinkets, uh, value, you know, the Vikings used to uh, launch people in ships or bury them in ships and kill a dog, things of that nature. You will always find like a, a kind of a death ceremony and sometimes that, that transition to the worship of death itself as a god. And the gods are broken to three parts. The gods are broken to, you know, uh, whatever type of labor that you deprive your existence from, whether it be like fertility not fertility, I'm sorry, but like land, your your agriculture. So you have like Ra in Egypt, uh, seafaring gods like Poseidon, like the Geeks, uh, the Greeks. Why well, don't I say Geeks? The Greeks, um, animal gods, uh, different forms of animals. I can't think of the moment. Uh, a worship of, of that nature. Then you have gods that are supposed to eventually, as civilization evolves, they'll give you divine attributes. Uh, going through the course of time, they have some sort of association with a particular characteristic uh, that humans want to achieve. That's the second form that gods take place. Uh, what is the third form? So you have like what keeps you living. Uh, basically ego gods that kind of validate gods. And eventually you have the form where uh, theocracies or gods themselves are people. You had that in Egypt, you had it in the Byzantines. Uh, you eventually had that in the Western civilization where the divine rule of law. Uh, you had it in Eastern civilization that takes many different forms, chiefdoms, things of different levels. Uh, the person or leader of a particular group is uh, divinely given power. 
either they have it, possessed it, they're gods themselves, or they have been granted access by the gods, uh, whether it be these gods up here or a separate set of gods, um, you know, that gives them these powers. Uh, you have that with a uh, great many civilizations. The other type of form of civilization is, of course, communication, whether it be oral, uh, written, or like the very large uh, temples. Temples are a form of communication in themselves, like the religious sites you always see uh, dug up, discovered, uh, the Egyptian pyramids. They are in themselves also a symbol. You know, their symbols, iconic. Uh, the hieroglyphics, particularly for the Egyptians, uh, Greeks, the forms of the temples, how they're shaped and things of that nature, are a form of communication. And you have that whether it be brick huts, uh, you know, straw huts, brick, you know, every form of civilization, the way and the nature of their worship buildings or massive buildings that their community uses uh, is another form of communication as well. And what happens with this form of communication is typically what happens is you see all the time is you see um, stories about, you know, gods, uh, the things that they teach their peoples. You find that in, in some sense. Uh, you might find some laws, uh, which kind of goes under contracts. You always find contracts, no matter what the civilization is, whether it's uh, the oral history that's discovered, uh, traditionals that show passed down. Uh, written tablets, papyrus, uh, contracts, contracts, contracts. So legal agreements between people and groups of people you always find with almost pretty much any form of civilization. And it takes in many different forms. It could be the oral tradition, it could be uh, the written word, the written form, or even in some cases, uh, even the, the type of uh, buildings, whether it be for worship, communal use, or like a palace, you will find written in it um, contracts of like how the king got it, who who built it, who paid for it, things of that nature, it, in almost a celebratory manner. Especially if it's like a temple worship about how there's like divine attribution. Uh, what else? Oh, the third thing is we're humans, so we always like to talk mad shit about each other. Uh, the entire Odyssey, uh, or even for example, the Iliad, it's basically the Greeks talking mad shit how they were victorious over the Trojans. Um, what's another thing? And just like, you know, the greatness of people. You, you always find that in written or oral form. You find contracts, talking mad shit, and then just like the, the daily lives that sometimes if it survives, uh, laws and things of that nature and contracts. Now what you don't find, and which is something that's talked about so often in this space, going back ages, is you don't really find this concept of the barter system. You always find some form of contract, oral agreement, or understanding between civilizations. Now there are, you know, individually, yes. Do people do peer-to-peer -peer transactions? Yes. But do the long transactions and the continuous growth of things, that never really existed. That is actually a myth. There's nothing substantiating the concept of a civilization or a group of people living on a barter system. They've always had some form of storage value, uh, medium exchange, unit of account, liquidity. And if you want to kind of give a fifth one, which is part of Bitcoin, there is some kind of ledger, some kind of form of accounting acknowledging that this transaction happened. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about this fifth one that sometimes is not applied to money but it's definitely going to be applied to Bitcoin. But the barter system, that's a bit of a myth. There, there's really no evidence. There's a lot of, sometimes people think of the common good as the barter system, that like, for example, the Amish raising the barn, um, building roads, uh, when communities build like roads together or uh, flood channels and things of that nature. That's the common good of the whole, and not necessarily really fits in the whole barter system you know by building a road or raising a barn it means your neighbor will sustain and continue to exist which is good for you because that means you're somebody you can trade with or somebody you have you know the whole storage of value media of exchange unit of account liquidity and a, a ledger that you know debts and exchanges and the diversification of the economy can still continue so i just want to talk about that um, i do know that we are in a peer-to-peer -peer system more of an individual concept where there's no third parties that has always existed but that's not bothering 
It's just people agreeing upon, you know, what they're exchanging, with the value they're getting, agreeing to some kind of contract, making a transaction and completing it, but doing it without a third party saying a seal of approval or uh, say that this is valid, which is the kind of current system that we are currently in right now in which Bitcoin is supplanting. But to get back to the concept of money, we're going to talk about storage value, medium exchange, unit of account, liquidity, and then we're going to talk about the keeping of the records, if you will. All right, so let's begin. So first up, the first attribute of the monetary system is a storage of value, number one. So Bitcoin is at that place right now. This is considered a significant, strong use case for storage of value. So as you can see here, we have you know the fiat representing all this. We got a little pennies, take our pennies, maybe convert it into you know quarters, make it up to one little uh, big you know one dollar, things of that nature. We place it in a nice containment place, you know whether it be a bank. In this case, you know my change is in this nice little hardware wallet, if you will. A place to store my value and this actually represents the story value of fiat you know granted pennies are not what they truly used to be valued or fiat in general but this is what Bitcoin is you take the little bits you make a one whole bit Bitcoin and you use it as a storage of value of your wealth this is something that is inherent because of the blockchain because of the public ledger because of the energy of mining that is done because of the decentralization, the peer-to-peer, -peer, the human input, because it's not a centralized authority, it has gained and garnered value over time from its conception of a paper from 2008 to the launching in 2009 of the first initial software program till now here in 2017, almost nine years later since the paper, almost nine years later since the initial launch of the software we're, we're rapidly approaching 10 years and we're we broken 8k for one single Bitcoin the value of you ever see those um, means where it says what one dollar got you or a hundred dollars got you in the grocery store back in the 50s 60s 70s 80s 90s aughts and now you see the diminishing value of the fiat but Bitcoin, BTC, has grown in its storage of value. It has grown in its value. And right now, it's very much in that first stage of the monetary system. It's where its strength is. Um, we'll talk about the other things and wrap it up what I think about this. But right now, we're very much a storage of value phase when it comes to the monetary system of BTC, of Bitcoin. Now we're going to talk about the other part of money, medium exchange. So, <clears throat> you got in your BTC, you're, you know, stored in a nice little hard wallet, you've gathered up all your coins, you know this has value, you purchase it, you know, maybe bought the dip, you've, um, you know, maybe exchanged, traded, maybe you've burned it, maybe you've mined it. The point of the matter is, you have this thing of value. You know people want it. You see the price all the time. You have a ticker. You have a smartwatch. You're tracking this. Maybe you just put it somewhere in like a hardware wallet or a paper wallet and you left it for like, you know, a couple years and then you pull it out and see, you know, how much you have and the value of it and you want to do something with it. And this is the part in the medium exchange. You're taking something of value that you know that people want that has a, you know, a fine, almost, yeah, you know, it is a finite quality. There's only going to be 21 million Bitcoin. You know, not everyone's going to get it. Maybe people are going to get a part of it, but not everyone's going to get a whole of it or some of it or even a part of it. So you want to take some of this value and you want to see what you can obtain with it, what people will part with, with this particular value. So I take my coins and I decided I want to negotiate. I want to talk to somebody about getting some Dr. Pepper. I want this soda. I want this two liter. I've been saving it. It's not a Lambo. It's a Dr. Pepper. Just partying with some of my coins 
taking, you know, which is, you know, the fiat symbols here and the quarters, gathering it up and going to a merchant or individual. So I start the negotiation process and, you know, the merchant is like, one Satoshi for this Dr. Pepper. I'm like, sweet. So I part with the one Satoshi for my Dr. Pepper and I walk away satisfied, satisfied customer. Now the merchant now has one Satoshi. And currently, right now, as far as a medium exchange, we have a bit of an issue, and we'll talk about that um, at the end. But I just want to talk about the function of a medium exchange. I've now exchanged this storage of value for a piece of property. In this case, it's some Dr. Pepper. And that's pretty much the function of a, a medium exchange. It's taking the value and exchanging it for something of either equal or even greater value to individuals, or even lesser value. That is the whole purpose and function when it comes to the monetary system for the medium of exchange. We're now gonna talk about the third component of monetary system, which is the unit of account. So we have our storage value, we have a medium exchange. So someone's willing to part with some property for the value that I have, for the value for the, they have, for the value that I have, and back and forth. But while I did state in the previous example for the medium exchange that the BTC unit of Satoshi, everything is priced out in fiat. Okay, and that is what a unit of account is, is when terms are priced out in BTC terms versus fiat terms. So for example, these coupons here, everything is priced out in $18.99, dollar amount, fiat, $20 off, you know, alignment check, free, the concept of free, but plus $20 off of alignment, $24.99, $100. I can go through and through with this Black Friday, Friday deals, the fiat value the people are pricing for their value. So they're providing a service, in this case, standard oil and filter change, for $18.99 and four tire rotations at Big O Tires a place. So for their value, the service that they're providing, the exchange amount that they're getting is U.S. you know fiat dollars, and everything is priced in those terms, that value of terms. Same here with this particular coupon for you know cold medication. It's cold season. So you want to keep your allergies and your nasal cord stops and things of that nature. Currently, as we speak, BTC, the unit of accounting, is not really utilized as a unit of account. You're not seeing things, as we talked about in the previous video, about labeling, you know, uh, the unit of pricing, you know, the Nashes or uh, Satoshis or your bits. You're regularly seeing that what you see is maybe you'll see a BTC price, but right next to it is the fiat price. Because what the person is really seeking, the merchant is seeking, is the fiat value of your BTC. And not really the BTC value of your storage of value for the item that they're exchanging. Because... As soon as they receive this value of BTC, majority of merchants, traders, peer-to-peer -peer transactions are trading out of fiat. Very few are, are storing, unless they're on an individual level, unless their purchase is understanding that they are keeping everything in BTC and they don't care about fiat, so they're willing to take an initial loss value in fiat and willing to ride and hold on to their BTC. That's what, um, what is the company? Oh, it's escaping me right now. But there is a company that has stated that they're going to start keeping 50% of the BTC that they receive and keep it a storage value. So right now, currently in the status, just to kind of sum things up, in the third part of the monetary system of the unit of account, BTC has not made it here. It's not considered the unit of account. It's very much still fiat terms. Even though fiat 
diminishes in value, even though fiat is corrupt, antiquated, horrible system, we still think in the unit of account in terms of the value of property in our medium of exchange of this particular value. We are still thinking in the terms of fiat instead of uh, the breaking down of how BTC is broken down with Satoshi's and Nash's. And just go to here to right here uh, for that video where I break down the, the different uh, denominations of Bitcoin or at least what I think it should be right there with the little eye so third part unit of account so liquidity is the fourth aspect of the monetary system so we got BTC over here we got fiat you can take fiat anywhere anytime with anything and you can obtain it, particularly USD, which is a global standard. BTC is not quite there. We're trying to get there, but we're not quite there. And here's the reason why. You have to be able to buy anything, anywhere. And I should put any time, but it's, it's a given. Like if I wanted to go down the street and buy the house for sale, it's down the street with BTC. I wouldn't be able to attain it. Now there are services that will take my BTC, convert it to fiat, and give me my anything. But that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to get BTC to be able to be the anything that people value. The medium exchange, the unit of account, the thing that they will hold, trade, and utilize as a monetary system. We're not there yet. Now, on a peer-to-peer -peer level, in small businesses, in a small sense, to, which is small con considering the entire volume of the global trade system, we can get some things, but not anything. We can get almost anywhere. There are many places, but it's not everywhere. It's not there. And some people think that when margin trading began on exchanges, it helped brought liquidity to this to the. Uh, BTC market and that these futures with Coinbase and the, the Chicago Merkle Exchange will bring a significant volume of liquidity, the ability for BTC as a function to be able to do anything anywhere. But I'm not so sure about that because again, the people that are margin training and they're in the future markets, they're still thinking in the fiat terms. They're taking that BTC and convert it into fiat. They're not thinking of BTC as a unit of account, as a medium of exchange, as liquid in its form and making it and building off of it to be a monetary system. To them, it's a storage of value. To them, it's an asset that they can trade for more fiat. And that's pretty much where we are in the BTC. We're in this weird space when it comes to liquidity. We just are. We're still building. We're still growing. But we're not anywhere in the state of anything, anywhere, anytime. And we'll talk about margin trading or futures um, at a different point about porting old economic concepts and systems into this new monetary system. But that is what liquidity is. The ability to buy anything, anywhere, at any time with the BTC that you have. Liquidity. So the fifth aspect, which fiat does have this aspect to it, but it's 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 bullshit. And everyone knows it's bullshit. So it's not an attribute that's really associated with the monetary system. But with Bitcoin, it's the legend. So the ledger is a fifth key component that I would say is distinctively no, you know, attributed to BTC. Now, this concept goes to Andrei Anapolopoulos. Um, I heard him speak about it, and when he spoke about it as a fifth attribute to the monetary system, something that Bitcoin brings, you know. It, Ding, ding, of course, that's what Bitcoin brings. And we talk about the public ledger, the blockchain, all the time. But actually conceptualizing it and bringing it into an attribute to the monetary economic system, you know, it's just, it was just a, a 
a light bulb, if you will, popped up in my head and I was like, of course it's an attribute. But it's also an attribute to fiat, but it's it's a bullshit attribute because of just the corruptive nature and the debasement and the fact that accurate accounting or ledger keeping is not important when it comes to the fiat system. So here's an example of the old type of system. You know, it's just very handwritten, very ad hoc. As you can see, interest is in pencil. Just pay off. What does that mean? Is it commission? You know, you kind of know what the commission is. But it's an example of a ledger. It's actually what was my grandfather's cabinet. The things he did for a property. He did property stuff. And, you know, significant, you know, value here, right? The payoff is like $11 million. $21 million for a piece of property in Miramar. You know, this kind of thing is interest overall. This is back in the 70s, 1977. So, this kind of aspect, this attributes, if you will, is very, it's very uh, just off the cuff. It's not extremely accurate. And when it comes to the fiat system, we have a significant amount of problems when it comes to ledger keeping. Keeping track of assets, the values of what goes in and out of something all the time. With Bitcoin, that is not part of the problem at all. And this is important when you think about liquidity, how that is an attribute to, to Bitcoin, anything, anywhere, margins and futures. But liquidity, you know, that single attribute of this ledger that is not talked about but is very distinctive and unique to Bitcoin because they've taken ledger and taken it to the nth degree is an attribute, an asset, if you will, a prime factor for its existence. Um, is ledger keeping so with the Bitcoin you have you know my address that I sent the transaction to the merchant so there's a, a transactional number indicating a transaction occurred on the blockchain there's an input and output so my address breaks up into two where I, what I'm sending to the merchant for my Dr. Pepper right here I got for one Satoshi and then my change. So whatever I had in this address, the change back will be go back to the address. The fee, whatever it may be, the fee it will be. Um, it used to be free for those who are new to the space. It used to be very low, but you know, whatever the fee is to make this transaction, I also pay and is noted and is placed in the public ledger for all the world to see forever, forever, forever. So as long as this address, which I have the Bitcoin, I control the bit, private keys. As long as there is a blockchain, this is like the blockchain where all this information is contained um, in a block and push out to the network. As long as that exists, this information exists. And this is very key because what it does, even though, you know, Hiroshi Shai, this is my address, he's going to attribute it to me. The transaction number, the input, output, the address, all that information is out there. Uh, you can see and know that I didn't double spin. You can see that I spent once a Toshi and got my change back. And it went to whatever merchant address. That merchant had, whatever it is, that one blah, 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 blah. And you can see that he received you know, that one Satoshi to that merchant address. And then you have the fee or whatever, which is paid to the miners and whoever mined this block and gathered, the, gathered my transaction, you can see the fee that they received as they gathered it with a bunch of other transactions in that block. And it's all tracked, it's all kept, it's all kept on the blockchain for all the world to see forever, forever, forever. So that is a main significant attribute when transparency, the ability to see these transactions and these inputs, outputs, fees that are paid, the transactional number, the addresses that they go to. When you're trying to track assets across something and keep an understanding of value, uh, keep an understanding of what is going on in an economic system and see it transparently, you're not gonna have things like uh, fake silver or fake gold 
You're not going to have, you know, um, what was it, uh, Wells Fargo making up bank accounts and adding bank accounts to their clients to pump up their numbers to increase their value on the stock. You can't do that with this change. You can't fake anything. You just can't fake this basic aspect of it. And that is what Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, BTC, brings new to the monetary system. This ledger format is what really fundamentally will give it its liquidity. It will give, make it a unit of account. It will have people use it as a medium of exchange. People will store the value, which they're already doing right now, and a significant amount and significant quantities. But it will strengthen all these attributes of the monetary system because this very unique aspect of it that really fundamentally has existed, but not in this very precise, clear, transparent manner has ever really existed before. It makes it an attribute and a value unique to the Bitcoin system and something that fiat can claim they have, but cannot present the numbers and facts to. So there's that. That's the fifth attribute right there, ledger to the monetary system. That Bitcoin BTC brings. So it's very clear to kind of wrap this up that as a community when it comes to making the monetary system, the known understanding the monetary system work for us that the attributes, the aspects of it, we're, we're definitely at the storage value unit. You know, Big Daddy here, Bitcoin, has proven that. Other crypto coins have proven that. You know, Ethereum, Litecoin to some extent. Now, very early on, when the storage value was very low, we were getting into the medium exchange. We had businesses, we had um, even B2B stuff going on, uh, merchant services, peer-to-peer -peer stuff uh, was, occur was occurring. Uh, it's still occurring with different coins, whether it be Litecoin, Bitcoin, or other coins. It's just not occurring at the volume that it once had. Um, and we need to build from there because it was very nascent and very, just just like a storage value is still very nascent for Bitcoin. Uh, we are not that very big of a community. Uh, we're just not. Uh, even if the value has increased significantly, we're still, we're still eons away from what the true potential of what cryptocurrency can do. But it's important, you know, medium exchange is important because it adds the value. If you want to be a monetary system, you have to have a medium exchange. Unit of accounting. Now, unit of accounting, I think the reason why we're not there yet is no one wants to be the first. No one wants to be the first to think in BTC terms and not fiat. Because even though we are building this new economic system, all our lives are still driven by the fiat system. So the fiat system still governs much of our existence. Even if we're drifting away and trying to attempt to build this new economic platform, we still have to engage and interact in the fiat system. So when you, you have to divorce your thinking, and, and think of it this way, we currently right now in the present are building this new economic platform. So it's very new to us. We are building it. We are not native to the space. We are the pioneers, if you will. We are the explorers. We are the individuals setting up the new uh, world, if you will. I mean, that might, might be the best analogy given what has happened in the new world. But that's what we are doing, this new economic platform. The I would say people below the party the age of 15 and lower, so the, the younger millennials and the new whatever they're going to call anyone born after 2020, the Zsters, if you will, the, the individuals are really much... Uh, of the 21st century because those born between uh, 2000 and 2020 they you know because of their parents or grandparents and because of the culture are still uh, having much of the 20th century influence of their existence their thinking and things because they're developing and making things what are new for the 21st century they're the ones developing it you know they are the pioneers the the explorers 
So I think those those individuals under 15 are going to be very native to the cryptocurrency space. Those on, born after 2020, this is this is going to be the economic system. So their way of thinking is going to be, um, as we talked about um, in the, the the naming of the unit of counts for Bitcoin, uh, they're going to think in Satoshi's, they're going to think in Nash, they're going to think of uh, Feenies and uh, Bits. They're going to think in those terms. But right now, we uh, currently here, the explorers are not thinking in those terms. And it really takes just, you know, nobody wants to be first. It really takes, you know, a big business uh, to do that, um, to be the first to think in the terms of Bitcoin. What is the value of the item in Satoshi's? What is the value of the item in Nash? What is the value of the item in Phoenix? What is the value of the item in Bitcoin? Not the fiat value, not what you can transact and exchange out into a fiat, whatever that fiat is. What is the value of Bitcoin for the item, for the unit of account? As soon as someone does that, as soon as a big business does that, whoever that is, it could be a small business, it could be a series of small businesses. As soon as that starts occurring, as soon as we start occurring into Bitcoin, we're going to start seeing more immediate exchanges. We're going to start seeing more volume of that occurring. Um, your account, liquidity. So liquidity is very strange in the sense that we're still using the, the old fiat system and the properties and porting the concepts of what is liquidity in that fiat system to Bitcoin. And it, it's, it's not going to work. Future trading is not going to work. Why am I going to bet on the price of the future of Bitcoin when I can freaking have it? It's better to own this item than to bet on its item. this item. Uh, margin trading, I think, is going to decrease a little bit because people are not going to necessarily trade Bitcoin like they do stocks or currencies now. I think there's going to be a point where instead of going up and up and up, we're going to have like a slow, steady valuation of Bitcoin. And the reason that is, is because of all the attributes of Bitcoin, because of the public ledger, because people want it, because of the thinking of unit exchange and the medium exchange and the storage value. We're going to think in different terms. Um, I'm going to link to the recent talk that um, Andre Annapolis had, um, or interview, if you will, on the Bitcoin podcast, where he talked about how we're going to be thinking of streaming uh of money we're thinking in not micro or macro but nano we're going to be thinking very differently when we utilize this system the forms of unit of account the forms of value is going to be very different and so when we import these old fiat systems like margin trading and uh, futures I, I don't think they're going to last very long it will propel us forward it will bring value to the system of being awareness but people are going to realize very quickly that it's better to just possess this than to bet on it which is basically what features features is it's better to not have a piece of paper saying you have bitcoin but actually have bitcoin um the whole margin training it's a it's a little funky wonky thing that's been going on for a very long time um i think what's going to eventually happen especially with atomic swaps and uh, Lightning Network, which has its own complications, but when that comes into existence, and the more decentralized uh, exchanges start getting uh, more volume of trade, you're gonna start people just purchasing this straight out and not really trading it. They're just gonna own it. They might exchange it for other cryptos, but they're gonna do atomic swaps with that. They're not gonna actually exchange it, so there won't be any, any need for margin trading. Uh, you're going to actually either have the fiat value or the other crypto value to get this. You're going to either earn this, mine this, be a developer, something. Um, I think eventually that you're not going to be buying this asset so much. You're going to be acquiring it through all sorts of different means and stacking up those Satoshis and turning them into Finnies and Finnies into, you know, bits and bits into Nashes and, uh, you know, and into Bitcoin and that Bitcoin into more Bitcoin um, or even um, you know Litecoin um, I think a lot of it a lot of what is going to happen is you're going to have a lot of um, crypto coins that are, are going to exist a lot you know we're at what 800 different ver versions of cryptocurrencies plus the tokens 
that puts us up probably around, you know, really around the 2000 mark of these different types of assets, that's going to get cut in half probably by 2018 and further, further down to eventually you are going to have just the few, which have been in the top, you know, 50 or 100 for a while now. The ones that have utility, the ones that have value, the ones that have a significant traction, strong community, the ones that people see as a means of not, of all the attributes of, of of, of economic storage and wealth and development and, 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 and goodness to it and, and it's not a scam. Uh, but you're going to see, um, you know, Litecoin is going to be, you know, as if people say the silver. Uh, Ethereum is, you know, a whole kettle on its own. It's, a, you know, smart contracts. You're going to see a lot of uh, other coins coming into play where you have that and you trade it either Bitcoin or Bitcoin out into those other coins for different types of purchases, if you will. Um, the ledger. I think um, the ledger is something that we are not really focusing so much on. I think even though I do not like blockchain spies, I don't like people being able to really um, narrow down and find people through either IP addresses or their past or going to maybe their coin desk or a, a past existing Bitcoin business and getting a person's address and contributing to that address and then going through the transactions history and finding what other transactions occurred with that Bitcoin address and see what the other associations are and, and tracking people down and finding their real identity. I like the pseudo anonymity of Bitcoin. I think it's very important. I like the complete and anonymous anonymity of Bitcoin. And I'm talking about just for the sole purpose of tax dodging. Uh, I think people, <laughs> that's a wet dream, okay? That's a dream that's never gonna happen. You're never gonna dodge taxes, I'm sorry. People do it now, they eventually do get caught. Sometimes they get away for, for a very long time, but they eventually get caught. They never pay the full amount that they should, but you know, they pay, they go to prison, something happens. Uh, it doesn't occur as often as it should, but it does occur. And you're mistaken if you think you, you're going to be like some of the big boys out there um, and escaping that. It's just it's just not going to happen. Or you're too small of a fish. It's just, it's just not. It's just it really honestly is not. But nobody should know the amount of, you know, coins I have or the amount I spend or who am I sending it to. I, you know, I think confidential transactions are going to come. I think um, Mumbo Wimbo is uh you know it's going to occur i think there you know there are privacy coins out there like monero and zcash uh, dash says is privacy but i have seen some issues about that uh i think that's going to eventually come to bitcoin maybe even to litecoin first it seems to be the testing ground but i think you're going to have where people you can still see not double spending if you will but what you're not going to see really is like who owns what and where the money's being spent you're just not going to see that. Um, now, what that will do for the whole concept of a ledger and transparency, I think that might change it significantly. And then it might be that Bitcoin won't do that per se. They might do something where it obfuscates and makes um, your privacy more easy to obtain in some sense. Maybe with confidential transactions and I have to look over it again. But I think the the attribute, the best attribute of Bitcoin, even though it's um, it's a, it can get people, if you will, the public ledger, the ability to see all those transactions, to see what address spends what to whom, I think that is an important aspect of it to see that much of what's going on. Now, if there's possible to maybe not attribute it to that to individuals or certain businesses and all you're just seeing is transactions and just money being spent, um, I can see that working. I do think that maybe will be key and maybe that's why privacy won't occur for Bitcoin, but for other coins is the fact that that fifth element, that ledger element that's never really existed prior before, really a strong concept of the of the counting of everything for all to see i think if when you put privacy in the sense that people want even i want i i think that will diminish the value of bitcoin i think uh, as an economic unit and as a new economic system maybe we can do it both maybe someone brilliant where it's a, both a public ledger and still have privacy maybe that that will happen but I, I don't see that really changing really for sure because it's too much of a value asset 
and it's too much what will be the thing that people gravitate to. I can see everything. I know what's going on. More so than I, I didn't bring it into the episode because I'm not sure just um, how to think about it. But the sixth part of a monetary system is the fact that a central authority created it. And Bitcoin is not created by a central authority. It's just not. It's created by everyone. 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 Everyone that exists in the current state right now of the world and soon to exist creates Bitcoin, creates cryptocurrency. We all own it. We're all going to use it. We are all going to transact in it. We, whatever level of usage we choose to engage in it, it's we that make it happen. The collective human we. Not a central authority we, not a banky we, not a, a single government we, not even a world government we. It's the we, the human we. For the first time, you can say that this is a, a property or an attribute of the human existence. This we, this particular concept here, this new monetary system that's being developed, Bitcoin, cryptocurrency. So that's it. I know it's a bit long, but it's very important to kind of get these terms that you hear all the time, break it down, and have an understanding of what it means for this system and where we're at. We're basically at the storage value. We do have a little bit in the medium of exchange. We have some liquidity. And the last point, I know people talk about how this takes time. It's going to take decades. I don't think it's going to take decades. I think we can do all these things at once. It's just that, you know, just kind of like gaming where you have certain levels where, you know, your life scale goes up a little bit, your health goes a little bit down, your ability to shoot goes up this, your level, you know, of vulnerability is here. We're going to have different levels and it's going to take a while. But because it's a new economic system, because it's not a central authority, because so many people are in this space, I think all these attributes, the storage value, the uh, medium exchange, the unit of account, liquidity, and the fifth one, the ledger, are all being developed kind of in the same way, and not in the same way, but at the same time, and a different, it's going at a different, like, express elevator at different levels and stuff, and as soon as we get to, like, an equilibrium, this thing will be the default unit of currency for the world. So that's it. That's all my thoughts. Thank you for listening, and um, to the moon, y'all.